Hey, hey, what's up, guys? It's Jordan with the Laundromat Resource Podcast. This is show 84, and I'm pumped you're here today because today we're talking with Peter Stern, and it is an incredible conversation. I mean, we I have like a few pages of notes that I was taking during this interview. There's so much good information, so much good knowledge that Peter drops. He's been in the industry a long time and he's had some unique roles in this industry too. So we get into a lot of that and I pin him down on a whole bunch of details uh, about how he and his company has been uh, successful running a laundromat over the years. So there's a lot of really good information. If you're an owner or if you're looking to be an owner, this is one that's going to have a lot of very practical, tangible stuff for it. So super pumped about that. Before we jump into it with Peter real quick, I want to say you guys are punks. Uh, <laughs> not really, but uh, I, last week on the episode, I announced that uh, the analysis calculator um, that we launched for pro members who get unlimited use. You can try it for free, laundromatresource.com slash calculators. By the way, that link and every link in this episode will be on the show notes, laundromatresource.com slash show 84, or if you're on YouTube down below. Uh, but anyways, I announced the analysis calculator. I'm super excited about it. I think it's going to be an awesome tool for anybody buying their first, second, thousandth laundromat. It's going to help them analyze deals and and determine the valuations of laundromats quickly and accurately. So I'm super excited about it, but you guys kind of flocked to it in force and <laughs> crashed it for, you know, like half a day or maybe even a little bit more than half a day. So just wanted to say that if you went to try to use that analysis calculator and it wasn't working when you tried to go, I just want to let you know that it's there. So you can go try it now, uh, laundromatresource.com slash calculators and, uh, and give it a shot. And again, pro members, unlimited use, unlimited access to that. Um, but even if you're not a pro member, you can try it for free, download the sleek PDF that it spits out for you. Really, really cool. Uh, but anyways, this week, uh, I am super excited. I have a couple of short books coming out. Um, they haven't come out yet. One is on uh, the whole due diligence process, everything you need to know about due diligence, uh, probably the most crucial part of buying a laundromat and doing it the right way. That's why I wrote a, a pretty comprehensive book on how to do that due diligence. That book is coming out here in the next few months. Um, however, the ebook version of that book, I have thrown into the, um, the pro membership there. So pro members, if you are out there, you can go download that, uh, the definitive guide on <laughs> laundromat due diligence. Uh, right now it's included in your membership. Uh, if you're not a pro member, just go be a pro member. It's going to be a no brainer. Uh, I think it already is, but there's a lot more even coming up over the next few weeks. Um, the uh, the other book that's coming out is on how to finance uh, or different ways to finance a laundromat deal. Um, so that's coming out and that book will come out uh, pretty soon here for pro members too, uh, well before its actual launch. So uh, excited about those pro perks there and there's more coming. Can't wait to share next week's uh, with you. I'm super excited about it. Okay. The other thing that I just wanted to say is you know, welcome to everybody who has been over joining the, uh, the membership over at laundromat resource, whether the free or the paid membership, uh, welcome to everybody. And one of the things that I, <laughs> I have loved that's been cracking me up is some of your guys's profile pictures. And we're ranging from like very professional, you know, looking like I can tell you you're serious. You mean business pictures to a lot of very hilarious, uh, hilarious pictures. I've been thoroughly enjoying your profile pictures over there. So uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying each other's pictures too. So whether you're commenting on, you know, the forums or whatever the case may be, and you're seeing those pictures. I'm just, I'm loving it guys. I am loving it. So, uh, continue to do that. Make sure if you are a member over there, make sure your profile is filled out. And what that's going to do a few different things for you is, you know, number one, it's going to help people get to know you a little bit better. And, uh, man, the whole, you know, saying quote or whatever, your, your network is your net worth. Like, 
I mean, it's so true. And, you know, the people that you're spending your time with, the people that you're learning from, the people you're interacting with do have a huge impact on you. So when you're hanging out with other people who are going in the same direction of you, as you who have similar goals as you, it's just going to help you reach them so much faster. So go fill out that profile, go upload a picture. I'm always curious to see, you know, if people are going to upload the serious business like, uh, which is awesome. And I think is really good or the hilarious which is also awesome and really good. So I just wanted to let you guys know some of you guys are really cracking me up over there. All right. uh, Enough of that. (laughs) Enough of that. Um, Last week I said that I was going to give away um, Dave Menz's book, hard copies, signed hard copies of Dave Menz's book, uh, Lawn Rat Millionaire, to uh, at least one person who commented on the forums this week. I'm going to give two away. And in order to let you know who the two people are that are getting the book, I'm going to bring my daughter on to tell you uh, just because she's hilarious. And I let her pick at random the people who were going to win. So I'm going to bring her on and then we'll jump into it with Peter Stern with an amazing, amazing interview. All right, guys, I'll see you when I jump on with Peter. Hi, my name is Evangeline Barry and I'm eight years old. And today I'm going to be giving away two Laundromat Millionaire books. And so if your name is called, congratulations. And if not, Okay, so the first book I'm giving away is to Alex Oliva. Yay, Alex Oliva! Next one is Jim Bernays. Yay! Okay, congratulations if you won, and if you didn't, too bad, so sad. Okay, bye! Peter, how are you doing, man? Thanks for coming on the show. I'm I'm good, Jordan. Nice nice to meet you finally. I've uh, been uh, listening to you for a while, so it's uh, it's great. Thank you for having me on. Hey, no, it's my pleasure, and I'm glad to have you on too. And uh, it's funny because I heard about you like a long time ago, and the the reason your name stuck out because I thought you were related to Mark Stern, and then I think it was Mark Stern who's like, oh no, we're not related, but I know who he is. Yeah, I think he, I think he hates that. But yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. no, uh, no, Mark, uh, a long time. Um, but God, it's going, going back almost 20 years that I know Mark, uh, good guy, great industry guy. Um, so ha- happy to be associated with them, but no, no, no relation that we know of. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's right. Well, okay. Well then if you're not related to Mark Stern, then can you tell us a little bit about who and not, not, not Howard Stern either uh, or, Howard Stern. or David Stern. Like, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Notable Sterns. <laughs> you're the most notable Stern in your <laughs> tribe. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> you are now, I mean, coming on the podcast, you're pretty much about to be thrown into the spotlight of fame. <laughs> blowing, blowing up. Yeah, I'll, be the right. new ki- I'll, I'll be the new king of uh, media. Move over, Howard, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, tell us a little bit about who you are. And I'm curious, how did you get into this industry? Uh, so, you know, um, you know, Peter Stern, a, a failed uh, baseball player. So <laughs> that was my uh, hopes and dreams as a little boy. What, it, oddly enough, it wasn't uh, getting into the laundromat industry. Um, oh, that, yeah, that, that wasn't my first grade uh, aspiration. So, but uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting path. I mean, life uh, in general, you, you never know uh, what roads are going to uh, lead you where. I actually was a uh, finance major out of school, uh, you know, was working at, at uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers on the consulting side. So had a much different uh, trajectory or vision or, you know, whether it was in investment banking or staying consulting. Um, and then uh, a mentor of mine who I interned with um, in college uh, was doing the real estate for Alex Weiss, the, the founder of uh, Laundry Capital Clean Rate Centers. And Alex was, uh, this was, you know, this back 20 years ago, Alex was uh, doing some uh, pioneering and some interesting things in the industry and he wanted some young blood. So he reached out to Lou to see if he had any young talent. And uh, Lou was like, you got to meet, you, you got to meet. And I was like, Lou, I love you, but, um, you know, a finance background, like what, 
what the heck am I going to do in the laundry industry? Like, he's like, you don't understand. This is different. You know, big box, 24 hours are taking over the world. I'm like, and so he, he's a pretty persistent guy. Um, and he's like, listen, just do me a favor. Meet, meet with Alex once, uh, uh, you know, you have a nice meal. If it's a waste of your time, you know, it's a waste of your time, but do me that favor. Uh, met with Alex. Uh, for those of you who uh, are in the industry, you probably know, uh, everyone knows Alex, um, uh, personality bigger than life, uh, really charismatic, engaging uh, person. And it, we hit it off. We've been lifelong friends and uh, colleagues and work uh, for him in many capacities. And uh, it's just set me on this journey that's been, um, you know, one hell of a ride. Yeah. Real quick. uh, I mean, Alex is kind of back innovating in this industry right now. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. And if actually, if you're in, if you're in Texas and you're looking for an opportunity to get into the industry, uh, Alex actually has a couple of opportunities. So shoot me an email, Jordan at laundromatresource.com. If you're out in Texas looking for an opportunity to get in the industry and I'll, I'll, pass on what he's got. Cause he's doing some interesting stuff right now. So anyways, enough about Alex. Uh, so, okay. So you met with Alex and, uh, he, he won you over. He impressed you. What happened? Yeah. So I came on board at the time. This was, uh, this was, uh, late nineties. And, uh, you know, it, it seemed like there were, there were a lot of different players. There was Laundromax, uh, there was Spin Cycle, Lucy's Laundry. There, you know, there, there was a lot of attention and focus on trying to replicate the successes of like the blockbusters of the world or Home Depot, take this fragmented mom and pop industry and uh, bring in the big box, 24 hour parking, uh, attended superstore concept and roll up and consolidate the, the industry. Um, there, uh, as we stand here uh, 20 years later, uh, not been done. There, there are a lot, uh, there were a lot of verticals and obstacles in executing in this industry that didn't exist and, and the others. Um, so, uh, but, you know, we were, uh, we went through these starts and stops. I, I, in one of the stops, I wound up agreeing to uh, depart full time from laundry capital. I went into business for myself, opening up my own laundromats. Uh, was very successful with that. Continued to consult for laundry capital along the way. We we always believed that there was this uh, big picture or this nut to crack in this industry, such massive opportunity. Um, untapped potential, but it was just, you know, we just couldn't get our hands around it in the right way. But we we kept at it. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Alex is an entrepreneurial mindset by nature. So, you know, we we, we just kept on uh, plugging away at different concepts uh, uh, along the years and different ideas. Um, you know, there there was a franchise route there, um, uh, and we you know uh, we wound up uh, opening a um, energy company along the way, Global Energy, which uh, is a seller of natural gas and electric reseller to to the industry and now uh, to other industries as well. Um, we oddly enough got involved in the uh, pawn shop business that we were looking to integrate into the laundromats. That, that's P-A-W-N, by the way, because sometimes it's <laughs> 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 something else. Um, uh, the, the other one might have been more lucrative, as, as it turned out. <laughs> but uh, that's, uh, we, uh, we, we uh, were in the uh, tattoo business for, for a little while. Um, and then uh, Alex actually uh, started his... Uh, uh, a real estate company, RW Real Estate, which uh, uh, went on to be, you know, extremely successful and, and uh, took on a mind of its own. So uh, we continue to innovate and figure out uh, ways to make money in and around the industry while we had this uh, core operating company that was, um, you know, steady and, and served as a, as a base of operations uh, to um you know, uh, 
try to uh, try to figure something out much bigger. Um, and then uh, somewhere along the way, I'd say about um, five, six years ago, we were looking into uh, uh, executing a peer to peer concept in the industry. I, I was a big believer uh, that that this was natural for for the industry that um, you had uh, it, you had the recipe for success there. We, we always believe on, on the wash and fold side, it, the workers really drove that business um, and very tough business to manage control uh, on a corporate level. Um, so we believed with technology, you could innovate and uh, create a peer to peer concept. The problem was is that we weren't um, technology company by by nature. You know, we didn't have engineers on staff. Uh, you know, what wasn't in our DNA, and um, you know, we we couldn't. Uh, we realized very quickly it wasn't going to be something that we could execute in house. But we we loved the idea, and then you know there were ideas of these. Uh, pick up and delivery services that we're watching, like like Washio, uh, and there was a huge demand for the business. We saw uh, various uh, companies in New York doing it, and and then around the country, and uh, you know, we we saw that these companies were very good at uh, creating the tech and a marketing platform, um, and and. They they were able to piggyback on some logistics apps that were already out there in the marketplace, but nobody was really focused on the back end solution of the processing. So we we always believed that that was the equation that the the quality and consistency of service was going to be what won there. Um, and again, old operating company, we're trying to figure out this internally. And then uh, after, uh, you know, uh, banging our heads against the wall uh, long enough, we said, you know what, we're not the ones to figure this out. There's all these uh, bright young players looking to get into the industry. They, they have the tech uh, experience. They're, uh, uh, they have the energy, they have the passion. And quite frankly, they have the, you know, they they don't have the cynical nature of 20 years of uh, things not working. So they, they come with a fresh perspective and, and that's healthy. Like, you know, where we say, no, that's not going to work because they just start doing stuff. And then that doesn't work. They pivot, do something else. And that's really what we believe was needed. So uh, Alex and I got together. We went on a hike. We were trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, uh, figure this all out. And we said, you know what? Let, let's not recreate the the wheel here. Let's not, um, you know, try to do everything ourselves. Let's launch a venture capital firm. Let's place bets on some of this talent out there that is is looking to get in this industry. There's lots of capital looking to come in. There's lots of young uh, uh, talent and, and founders and software engineers that are looking to get, but they don't have the industry expertise. Let, we can be that value add. We, we understand the industry really well. We know what it needs. We know it's landmines. Um, we, we thought we could be really good strategic investors. So that's what we did. We launched this fund, um, you know, one of our early investments and success stories was Sense, who is a, a POS software as a service business that's really blowing it out of the water. Um, so, and then, uh, then in my due diligence, I came across Mr. Jeff, which, uh, was a co international company based out of Spain, but had a worldwide reach, sold 2000 franchises across the globe, uh, really focused on the app-based concept, pick up and delivery, wash and fold, service business, all the aspects that we believe are a huge growth area, huge trajectory um, for the future of the industry. And they were bringing the all the tech uh, and and all the marketing uh, chops to to really make this happen. 
And it was a franchise concept, which we love because we, we always believed that that end of the business, counter business, it, it needed the TLC of an owner operator. So did extensive due diligence, uh, met with the CEO, another dynamic, brilliant uh, personality. Um, and uh, we wound up making a substantial investment in Mr. Jeff uh, and also agreed to partner with them to help them launch in the U.S., uh, and in doing so, uh, I, I also, full disclosure, invested personally in Mr. Jeff as well. Um, really excited about the concept, became so excited that uh, agreed to switch over full time and, and help them launch here in the U.S. So that's what uh, that's what I've been busy doing for like the last <laughs> six months. It was like quite the whirlwind that you, you know, kind of went through uh, going from something totally different than this industry and then wind it up where you're at right now. Uh, so let's rewind. I mean, I want to ask you about Mr. Jeff here in a little bit, but before we get to that, let's rewind back a little bit. Um, what, so when you, when you started working, you know, with Alex and, and all that, what was your, what was your role? Yeah. So I, I ran the operations of the company for a little while. Um, I did some uh, acquisitions uh, in the, in the early days and then uh, then moved more into a strategic role. And uh, I, I was a SVP where I, I, I'd work on strategic growth and um, uh planning and trying to figure out a lot, a lot of it was, um, you know, out after I, I really, you know, uh, after getting out of the operations, day-to-day -day operations of the business, I knew it really well. And then after running my own laundromat, knew it even, uh, better. Uh, but then I felt I could came, come in from more of a high level and figure out, uh, 20,000 foot view of how we can uh, approach things differently, not only in the company, but in the industry as a whole. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. So, I mean, you started like kind of in the, the smaller specific role with the acquisitions and operations and then kind of expanded out to, you know, some of those higher level thinking things, which is pretty cool. Can we talk just for a second about, you know, when you were running, uh, when you were running operations, what, you know, what, what was it about what you guys were doing that was making you guys so successful? I mean, you guys scaled up, you know, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, you know, uh, owners of laundromats. And so how did, what was it about the operation? What were you guys doing that allowed you guys to scale so big? Well, so I think it, first and foremost in the, in in this uh, in that industry, and especially in big box, when you're you know building five thousand square foot uh, laundromats with parking, um, real estate is critical to to scale. And so it's uh, probably one of the biggest hurdles to that big national play and and, and development. Um, it's uh, you know it takes uh, a lot of time to find uh, the right site, you know, vet it for development and um, and then the actual execution of the building and then then ramping of stores. So that that whole process, I think we became, um, you know, really proficient at. And uh, we also, as opposed to the spin cycles and laundromats that were, you know, uh, backed by um, third party capital, um, you know, they, they sort of had a pressure to grow and grow quickly and we never did. So I think that we, uh, every, every site was evaluated standalone, you know, a lot of due diligence go in, um, you know, and we, we were able to really, uh, pick quality locations. I, I think that, that, that was key. And then, um, uh, in a capital intensive business that, you know, takes along the, the, the ramp is, is critical. Mm -hmm. So the speed of the ramp and, um, through like, listen, we, we made a lot of mistakes early on and, and figured stuff out, but, uh, it, you, you, you constantly learn and then, um, you know, keep on, uh, building your process. And we, we got really good at, uh, ramping stores quickly. I think that, um, 
you're seeing more of it today, but when when we were first starting, um, wasn't a lot of marketing spend in in this business, and we always believed in in spending the marketing, and um, you know that would get us to the the ramp faster, and uh, that made the DRI investment more more successful. Then, um, you know, when it came to operations, like listen, uh, everyone loves this business because from from the outside, it's a simple business, mm-hmm. and I. And that's true uh, at its core, right? Um, but there's an art to executing the simplicity day after day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, and that that takes a uh, special type of uh, operator and commitment um, to, you know, making sure that... Uh, all, all those key aspects of the business are just uh, taken care of consistently. The, the cleanliness, your equipment working, customer service. Um, you know, and as soon as you get arrogant and think, all right, I got this. I can look away for a moment. Those things will start to slide. And they, they don't slide like um, overnight. It's, it's like the boiling frog. It's so gradual that you don't notice it. And what I've always said in, in this business is that um, sales are a lagging indicator of performance. So what happens is, is that y- you you don't have that uh, like instant uh, feedback mechanism to tell you whether you whether what you're doing is right or wrong. And because of that, you can get fooled into complacency to think, okay, well, I. Yeah, I stepped off the gas a little bit and nothing bad happened. So I could, and then six months later, you, you see the ramifications of that. And then it's going to take another six months to get it back mm-hmm. of, of hard work and consistency. So um, just having that conviction and doing the right thing day after day is, is really important in this business. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's interesting because you're dead on with, you know, the sales being the lagging indicator. I've seen that in my own <laughs> business. I would say for myself personally, you know, that consistency day after day after day and just being on top of things all the, like that's the hardest part for me. And it's not the part of the business that I love actually, <laughs> uh, but it, it's super crucial. But I'm curious if sales is the lagging indicator. I mean, do you have anything that you're looking at as like a leading indicator? Um. So, like, listen, this has been it's been an interesting journey, especially with Mr. Mr. Jeff, because now we're getting more insight into our customer base and metrics and in real time data. Uh, We didn't have those tools. So really, it's it's old school and it's uh, in your stores talking to your customer base, talking to your uh, employees, watching the business. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a presence that, that, that you have to have. Um, there's certainly uh, uh, metrics that, that you can look at, but like, like I said, uh, you know, it's, it was more, uh, I, I've always been um, shocked by the amount of people in this business that um, have a disdain for their customer base, um, <laughs> and that's a, it's always been a puzzle and an enigma to me. And you know, I, so for me, when I you know was running the operations or when um, I, I ran my own stores, it was talking to your customers. They'll tell you. I mean, <laughs> it's <laughs> there's no secrets. The, they'll tell you exactly what's going on, how they feel, what you could do better, and you got to listen. Um, you, you got to listen to the feedback, uh, that that's, that's your bread and butter. They're, they're the ones putting food on your table. Um, listen to them. And the more, the more you open up that dialogue and, and establish that trust with your customer base, the more you inform them and, uh, the, the better pulse you'll have. Yeah. So are you, I mean, were, were you back then, were you, were you doing that as you were scaling up? I mean, I, I imagine that gets more and more difficult to do at specific locations, at least as you start to scale up, are you training employees to do that? Or are you 
getting snapshots at different places and kind of trying to apply the lessons kind of across the board. How, how are you handling that? Yeah. So, you know, that, and it, so if you're asking about like in my own stores, which, you know, was very small, I was able to do it and execute on a personal basis. And I was able to instill that and model that behavior for my managers and then for my staff. And you created a culture around that, that, that just became um, prevalent and, and persistent. And if you, if you were continuing to lead that, then, then others followed and that, and, and that was effective. I, I did find, uh, you know, like in, in a, uh, a chain, you know, uh, as large as clean, right. That um, it, it does become harder and harder to, to, to do that on a personal level and then building that culture uh, around that becomes harder, especially when your turnover is high and you, you're, you're working with a um, employee base that, that that's constantly changing. So that's um, that that's quite frankly been a challenge in the business for for scale and growth. Um, and the the good owner operators that are hands on um, really have really have an advantage in there. Um, you know. It, so, and I think the way that the business is changing, um, it's even more and more important because when when we first, uh, you know, when we were first going at, at, at Laundry Capital, um, it was mostly self-service. So the customers did their own work. You're more focused on keeping your equipment running and uh, your stores clean. And and listen, having somebody friendly with a smile that, that you know, uh, w- w- was important, but it, it wasn't the make or the break uh, of the business um, because there are a lot of stores across the country that operate unattended, you know, so that, that, that really wasn't. But now you're seeing a, a big shift towards service. So more of this hospitality nature is, is more and more important. And um, that's a culture change in the industry that it's a dramatic shift. And I'm not sure uh, everyone's quite figured that out yet um, and, and how to execute that in, in, in the best way. So, you know, I always say like, especially on the, on the wash and fold side, because wash and fold is all about trust. People uh, in retail always focus on average ticket, which I think in it's it's good for certain aspects. But what they're missing in wash and fold is the average value that people are leaving in wash and fold. So the average ticket might be thirty, forty dollars, right, for a bag of laundry. But how much value is in that clothing? It could be upwards of a thousand dollars, or if it's your favorite pair of jeans or t-shirt, it's invaluable it's irreplaceable mm-hmm. so trusting who you're leaving with that uh, it, to, to process those clothes is critically important and um you know that 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 takes a different level of customer engagement um and i think we can learn a lot from like the restaurant industry when when uh you know we, when you go to a restaurant um you know, do you, do you want to go to a place where nobody knows you or do you want to go where they know you by name? They have your favorite table. They, they already have your drink ready. Like that, that sort of approach to this business, I think, um, is, is, is what's really going to make it work in, on, on the service sector of the business. And that, that's where I believe all the growth is. Yeah. I mean, I love that kind of framework of thinking where, you know, I mean, it is trust. And I like the, I've, I have, I haven't really heard anybody talking about, you know, the value of the order and how much, I mean, I mean, we know kind of, you know, implicitly, or when something goes wrong, customers let us know, right. We lose something or something, you know, gets torn in the dryer or something like that, which happens sometimes, you know, we hear about, you know, Hey, this costs this much money, you know, that, that kind of thing. But, uh, I haven't really heard that as like a metric and, you know, thinking about it in those terms does kind of, I think, add a little more weight to the, you know, that service side of the business and, you know, how much, uh, 
trust there is in people. And there's kind of two, maybe there's more, but two that I can think of off the top of my head, ways to build that trust. And one is like you were saying, get to know your customers personally, you know, and, and get to know them by name. And, and hopefully they're going to refer you and transfer their trust to people that they know they're trusting you to people that they know so that they'll also trust you because, you know, your current, your current customer that they know trusts you or to do it more, I'd probably say, and, and to do it more on, uh, on a, on the bigger scale on the more public platforms like a Google, like a Yelp, those kinds of things where trust is also transferred, maybe not by somebody that, you know, personally, but, but by the masses. Right. And so that's why, you know, getting, good reviews, you know, offering good service is one thing, and it's definitely going to help your business, but taking that one extra step and trying to, uh, purposefully get reviews and intentionally ask for reviews actually is another way to kind of build that trust. Uh, and, and again, the, the more valuable the product is for the customer, the more trust you need to build. So anything you can be doing service wise to build that trust is going to be huge for your business. Uh hundred percent. Uh, and I, I see it in my own, uh, service, uh, hat. like when I, when I'm looking for a new service, like we've all become like these, uh, uh, hack consumer research, uh, consumer reports, people where we're going through reviews and cross-checking sites because, you know, uh, it's, it's not just the rating. You want to make sure the reviews are valid and that they, you know, they, that and you want to check uh, all right is this uh propaganda or is it real and people know the difference and they want to see even that the negative reviews that they were like when i see like listen you're going to have negative reviews it's inevitable hopefully otherwise you don't have enough business if you don't have enough volume business um then you could have you know six five-star reviews but which, which by the way People see also there's not enough reviews. That's a red flag. But, you know, when you get into hundreds, uh, if not thousands of reviews, you can have some negative ones. And what I look for is, is how do the business respond? And the really good ones, you'll see that they're all over it and they're responding and owning up to any mistakes and criticisms and, and taking care of the customer. So this is a it's a, it's a new world. It's, it's changing fast. And I, I think, um, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like um, that's, that's a big part of the trust nowadays. And I, I go back to emphasize that point of the value. Like if you're just, uh, if you're just ordering a hamburger, you might just take a, a you know, um, uh, a gamble uh, one night in order from a new place without much research. Right. Like uh, I, I take my food seriously, but one, one meal, like I'm not going to put in hours of research, but for, a th- you know, for a thousand dollars worth of my clothes and my favorite stuff, like, uh, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to put some effort into that. And then the residual effect is, of that is because I'm, I'm not just doing this once I'm, I'm doing it every week after that. So it's, it's, it's worth, it's worth the research. Um, so I think yeah. I need to keep that in mind. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, I, I love, I love that. I love that. And I think that that will be, you know, just for, for anybody listening, that's a, that's just a great mindset to have, especially if you're doing somebody else's laundry, whether it's pickup and delivery or, you know, just a, a wash dry full to drop off, you know, laundry service. Uh, I mean, I, I like thinking about it in those terms because those are the terms that our customers are thinking about it. And even if it's not, even if they're not explicitly thinking, I'm giving over a thousand dollars worth of clothes yeah. to these people, you know, guess what? Don't deliver their clothes one time and find out how much, you know, they. One item. Yeah. One, yeah, item. one item. Yeah, I know. And, you know, the, 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 that's what, that's what I think like, uh, or like a lot of the big, uh, you know, uh, venture capital back players like Washio missed in this industry is um, the the error rate, the margin of error that we have in this business is so small. When you think about the the countless items of clothing we process, you know, in and out every day, you know, the jeans, the shirts, the socks, like, like you know. 
I mean, how many articles of clothing? And screw up one uh, pair of jeans, one T-shirt, you know, a comforter, like just one. And you'll, I mean, it'll wreak havoc in in your in your day. So, like to, to think about the the accuracy rate or the the quality rate that you need to have in this business, you need you need to be uh, incredibly on point. Um, and yeah, you know, it's it's a testament to what a lot of good operators out there do day in and day out. And people, when they add, go back to your question, like, what's the key? What what's this? What's the uh, you know uh, essential aspect to success? It's it's hard to describe in this like magic bullet of something that's going to be so poignant and so earth shattering that people uh, you know you know blow people's brains. It's like uh, doing stuff consistently well time and time and time and time again. That that's 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 the secret, um, and it's really hard to do. Yeah, it, it is really hard. It's really hard to do even just in like self-serve laundry, especially right now where it can be difficult for people to find good help. You know, if, if I've, I've gone through periods where I've cycled through, you know, attendance because we have for various reasons and, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to provide a consistent environment even let alone a service but even an environment right you're cycling through people and that just adds a whole nother layer kind of on top of it which kind of brings well, your, it I, your people need to care about the customers and about the clothes like they they have to you know uh be incredibly conscientious and in return like to, to make that happen you have to care about them and I think that's a, a common mistake that that happens in this business. Uh, people focus on uh, on on the the dollars and cents, and they they're so anxious to look at their revenue and check their receipts of their cash register. But um, you, you need to you need to invest time in your employees. Uh, it, it it you know um, a lot of great operators or owner operators and family. So they're vested in the business, but if you're going to have people working for you, you got to care about them. Yeah. Yeah. I think I love that. I wrote down that quote, you know, your people need to care about, you know, the, the people and the clothes, but in order to make that happen, you need to care about it. I love that. I love that. So, okay. So, I mean, we're talking about, this is, I'm just, I'm going down the rabbit trail here. Uh, this is, you know, what we're talking about is creating that consistent, you know, consistent experience, that consistency, every, every, you know, order needs to be processed correctly. You can't be losing stuff. You know, you can't be ruining stuff. What kinds of systems or processes do we need to be putting in place here? And how do we, you know, how do we set that up? Uh, cause it seems like I'm, I'm getting a little nervous now talking about this. Cause I'm like, wow, the responsibility seems very heavy. You know, is this a responsibility yeah. I want to take on? So what tools or what systems or processes do we need to help us kind of? Yeah. So I, I think technology can help a lot. Uh, unfortunately, because the industry was so fragmented, uh, for so many years and, um, th- there wasn't, there wasn't the investment in technology infrastructure that there should have been or compared to other uh, major retail industries that you'd have this uh, technological advancement and infusion. So uh, from a technology standpoint, um, a a lot of the systems have been left behind. That's changing. So it's coming in. So, so using that will help. I I mean, I do know that, um, Building that culture uh, is important of attention to detail and and to make sure that uh, it's one thing to create a process, but uh, to make sure it's followed, uh, you know, at a, at a very high hit rate is uh, is extremely important. And I 
So I, I'll go back. Uh, one of the things that we did during the height of the pandemic, I was still uh, working at Laundry Capital. And because we were having so much trouble uh, staffing during that time, we we're, were in New York. So we, Queens and Brooklyn, we were the epicenter of, uh, of, of it all. And it was uh, horrific. And, you know, we were struggling to, number one, staff our stores in general, but number two, more and more people wanted wash and fold because they didn't want to be inside a closed environment with a bunch of people. So there were more and more people dropping clothes off. Um, As a result, we shifted our operation to this hub and spoke concept where we uh, shut down one of our uh, biggest stores to the public. And it just became a, a wash and fold processing facility, called it the hub. Um, and so every day in New York, we picked up from you know our uh, 40 locations, brought it to the central processing facility, uh, did all the clothes and, and, and shipped it back out. I, I, I think at the height, we were doing 14,000 pounds of clothing a day. Um, a, a, a ma- massive undertaking and uh, didn't really have the technology built for that. So now we had to answer that question. How do we do this much volume and, you know, have the consistency? And I was going to be my question right now is how do you, especially when they're coming from 40 locations, not only do you have to wash clothes and not ruin them? You have to wash clothes and not lose them. But now you can't mix them up and now you can't send them back to the wrong location. Like the, uh, the level of complexity there is giving me more anxiety. So, I mean, how did you guys solve that? So, you know, and, and it was, it, was uh, it, it happened so fast that like we didn't, obviously nobody knew the pandemic were coming. It wasn't like we, you know, sketched this out for six months and did beta. Time. We just jumped into it. So um, I had to like really figure it out very quickly on the fly. And I, you know, I thought back to a book that I read many years ago and it was a checklist manifesto. Um, you know, and, and it's incredible. Like, you know, so when, when you take the airline industry and like you use them as an example and it, like they're the quintessential example for making sure little things are done extremely consistently. That seems stupid that how could I forget to do this? Or, you know, it's, it's not a big deal, but they have a culture ingrained in them that is unbelievable. And that's why, you know, the fail rate in the indi- air- airline industry is, you know, um, astonishingly low. I mean, because we all know if a aircraft, you know, drops out of the sky or, or crashes, it's catastrophic to the world. It's headline news. Um, and uh, they, they have, you know, so many guardrails in place to make sure that these errors don't happen. And it's this um, religious, obsessive uh, attention to detail and cross-checking. And that was, uh, you know, a a lot of the basis for um, the philosophy behind what we set up, you know, uh, that I set up in the hub, that we had um, every step of the process, a check in uh cross check so you know and like so there was pick up at, at the stores then they had to uh sign it off to the driver driver checked it in we checked the weights at every checkpoint to make sure that you know because sometimes maybe you're missing a bag but then the check of the weights would tell you um you had tickets uh on the outside of the bag i had tickets on the inside of the bag in case the ticket came off um you know and when the clothes went to the washer, it, it, the, the ticket followed it. And when it transferred, because sometimes you're going from the washer, then you get interrupted and then you have this card of clothes that nobody knows where it is. So every single step of the process, and then, you know, it comes down to inspect what you expect and um, you know, the classic mantra. So you know, you couldn't just create this system 
and expect it uh, to just magically happen, you had to check that it was happening all the time. And, and when people knew that it was being checked, then you had to have built-in rewards for people doing the right thing. I always like to say, catch people doing the right thing and recognize and and, and praise them for that. And, um, you know, we just built that culture where uh, the, the quality and consistency was rewarded and uh, reveled in and, you know, um, that everybody was uh, really, really focused on this. Yeah. I mean, that, first of all, uh, Checklist Manifesto is awesome. I'm going to link it just in case anybody wants to uh, check it out. You can check it out in the show notes or for you on YouTube. The link will be down below. Uh, super good. And, you know, airline industry surgeons, I mean, like the, you know, the people who have to do things right uh, have, like you said, they have these checklists, they cross check, you know, at, at all points, there's multiple people checking just to make sure that you're doing things right. And if you're, you know, going back to that value metric of, you know, here's, here's how much this load of laundry costs that somebody just dropped off into my care, you know, well, when you're doing 14,000 pounds of laundry, you know, the value of that every single day is significant. So you want to make sure you get it right. Right. So, but the same, you should have the same exact mindset if you're doing a hundred pounds of laundry a day or what, you know, wherever you're at on that spectrum, you need to have that same mindset. So, and and I'll tell you, like there, there's been, uh, when we go back to the, the washios of the world that, um, and there, there's been, I won't name them by name. There's a number of others that are still around. Um, you know, and I, I think everyone has struggled in that that online on demand pickup and delivery service laundry. Everybody struggled with the the same thing. Is that um, it's really it's really hard to acquire customers in this business, mm-hmm. um, and they've struggled. I I believe because they didn't control the quality and retention has been a huge issue. So if you're going to fight really hard to get a customer, don't lose them. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, and it's more exciting to get new business. Everyone, everyone loves that. Like they, they love the marketing side and they love it. It's, it's more glamorous. It's more fun. But um, if you can't keep your customers, then you can't win in this business. So retention is the key. And um it's it's not sexy, it's not glamorous, but this this is the nuts and bolts that need to be done in this business daily to to retain your customers. Um, and uh, you have them already, and so so many customers come in organically. But um, I, I think that hanging on to every single customer and fighting for it in, in this way through the quality and consistency is incredibly important. And and, and I think it's. Um, I think it's a lot. I think that that's one of the biggest mistakes about uh, outsiders into this industry is there's an arrogance that, um, that, you know, they just focus on getting the customers and not, not keeping the customers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, like you said, if you're, if you're getting new customers, yeah, it's exciting. But you know, what's a lot more exciting than that is making good money by providing a good business, right? Like, yeah, 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 sure. You can say I got, you know, a hundred new customers this week or whatever, but if you just lost 99 of them, like you just wasted a whole lot of money and, you know, so. You're on this constant treadmill, just churning through new customers. um, And it's a, it's a very uh, slippery slope and dangerous business model to, to be on. Yeah. And, you know, and when we're talking self-serve, you know, one of the, speaking of which, I mean, one of the metrics I don't hear talked about a lot is that churn rate and self-serve. It's, it can be difficult unless you have a card system, it can be difficult to determine a churn rate, but that is definitely a metric for the wash and fold and for the pickup and delivery that should be, that's one of the KPIs, right? Key performance indicators should be that churn rate. So you should know when you acquire a customer, how long that customer on average is going to be there. And that's going to help you determine lifetime value and all that. And then you can start to implement ways to, you know, extend out that timeline for the average customer. Right. And that's where you start, you know, 
optimizing that business, you start making more money, you know, and, and you know that you're providing a better product at that point too. It's, it's interesting because there's never really been great data in this industry. Oh, we don't know our customers. We don't know the customer habits. And, um, it's always been an incredibly consistent business in terms of sales. Once a store is ramped, like it stays consistent. So there's long, there's been this long held belief that, um, you know, it is a steady business uh, um, from uh, customer churn that that you don't have a lot of turnover. But um, you know, now that I, I'm, I'm working uh, with Mr. Jeff and we have insights into uh, customer data and we're able to track customer habits, I, I think that people are going to find very soon that that a lot of their assertions and assumptions about the customer habits in this business are are um, false and that, that, that sales have largely been a matter of, uh, capacity Mm -hmm. in this business that, you know, you have a certain amount of equipment, you have peak periods and, you know, most busy, good performing stores, um, if their all their equipment is running, their equipment spinning during those peak periods and, and, like there's, there's an overflow that goes to the laundromats or it's, but whether those, they don't know whether those customers are the same customers, they just know that the same machines are spinning at the same times. Well, you know, to me, there's an unbelievable power uh, and massive opportunity to be unlocked. If we understand that customer habit and then we can change that dynamic even out the uh, demand curve of this business, offer them incentives to come during off peak periods. Make sure you're remarketing and, and capturing customers. They, they, there's there's a tremendous amount of power that I think is coming down the road um, when when we now begin to understand and know our customers and. Uh, what their needs are and um, how to market to them and how to retain them, how to um, re-engage them when you they left. Like, wouldn't it be great to know that a customer left you and understand why um, mm-hmm. and then target them to get them back? So all of this hasn't historically been done really well in the industry, if, if at all. And uh, I'm really exciting, uh, excited about what's in the pipeline with the technology to come. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did actually a couple of podcasts on data. I did one where just talking about the importance of data and how we haven't really been using data in our industry at all, you know, for the most part and how that is going to be the, in my view, that's going to be the biggest unfair advantage for the people who are jumping on the bandwagon now in learning how to use that, how to collect that data, how to organize that data, how to use that data to make better business decisions. Uh, I'll link that podcast episode for anybody interested. Uh, Got a lot of really good feedback um, on that one. But I also did an episode talking about how that, that very fact, the fact that the data is super powerful is, is, a little bit of a concern in this industry, in my view, and I don't hear anybody else really saying this, but in my view, and I'll just put myself on the limb here, you know, with a lot of the manufacturers offering, you know, pay through their systems uh, and, and tracking that data, getting that customer data, not a big deal until now that these manufacturers are starting to, you know, buy up distributors, build stores, put stores in the, in the places where their customers are. Uh, and you know, they're working on a different level cause they have a huge swath of data that they can make those business decisions on. So something interesting also to keep an eye on in this industry, that data can be a double edged sword. And I think unless we as owners and operators are, are trying to get into that data game early. I think we're going to get left behind. If not by other owners, we're going to get left behind by the distributors and, and not distributors, but the manufacturers uh, there too. So interesting. I, 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 I agree with what you're saying and you, you just need to look laterally to any other 
uh, massive retail industry and look how data has changed the game. And it, it's um, if, if you ask any uh, CEO of any major retail chain, um, you know, owning owning their customer is one one of the critical aspects of their strategies today. And um, right now, the laundromat industry, uh, the owners own their revenue. They don't own their customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, that's something to, to be on the lookout uh, down the road. Yeah, I just want to let that sit for a second because I mean that's a that's a pretty that's a pretty powerful statement right there. You know, the owners own the revenue, not the customers, and you know, and I think that you know, data data is the ownership that we're talking about, right? Like the customer, you know, patterns, the customer behaviors, you know, all all this data that you can you can snag and analyze and make decisions off of that. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about ownership. And so, yes, I mean, the customers are coming to your store. So they're your customers, but that, that data is, is where the real money is, uh, you know, on the, on the bigger scale. So I'm, I'm interested to see, you know, how, how you kind of keep going and Alex and, and people like you guys, uh, who are now getting better and better access to that data, how you're going to be able to, and how this whole industry is going to be able to evolve and change and, uh, and grow. And, you know, I've already, I've been saying for a while, like even over the last five years, this technology has increased and there's been more interest in the industry and there's more savvy business owners coming in. This industry is changing rapidly and it's becoming much, much much more sophisticated uh, than it has been for, you know, decades, you know, before. And so I don't know, it's just kind of interesting. I think that right now is a really interesting time to be in this industry because there's a lot of change happening and whenever change is happening, wealth think, can be trained. I think it's, I think, I think we'll look back or maybe not us, but our kids or grandkids will look back at this period of time. And th this will be a, pivotal time in history. Um, so I, I think it's not just an interesting time to be in, in the laundry business or any business. I think it's an interesting time to be a human. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't say that lightly. If you look at the advancements in AI that, that uh, you know, are in the pipeline or even, you know, starting to permeate society and you look at the rate of change in society, that has occurred and it's been, I mean, the pandemic just poured kerosene on a trend that was already, you know, um, uh, pretty um, significant in society, but we haven't seen a rate of change like this. I mean, if you, if you study history and you can go back and, you know, look at the industrial revolution and that, that was a bit of a time, but the, the, this, uh, and it's hard to appreciate while you're living through it. Um, so, but it, the, the force of magnitude that's occurring um, right underneath our feet is uh, seismic. And for anyone to think that uh, the status quo, if, they, if they're just continuing to ride out this wave the 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 way they are today i you just you're gonna be left behind um if you're not forward thinking uh today yeah i, I it's funny i i was watching um a documentary on uh it, it was blockbuster and netflix and you know like it was just uh it was hard to for Blockbuster to conceive the changes. I mean, it was hard for the major studios of Hollywood to understand like that they were giving away. You talk about owning their users. They were giving away their content just because it was incremental revenue to build this behemoth of Netflix while they're just accumulating all of their users. And when you look at the value of that today, 
I mean, if, if anyone understood it, they, they clearly never would have done it. And I'm sure there's tons of executives uh, kicking themselves today, but it, it was um, amazing. Uh, you know, um, so I, I just, and that's not that long ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Well, yeah, and it's crazy because it's it. You know what's funny is I don't know if it's funny or not, but the the rate of change is it's like impossibly fast right now. But what might be even faster is our how how quickly we get used to think like think about not walking around with a phone in your pocket. Like I'm not that old, but I didn't have a cell phone until I was in college. Yeah, I didn't walk around with the phone. And and even when I had a cell phone in college, I could play that little snake game, you know, where it went around. (laughs) That was pretty much it. You know what I mean? Like that. And, and now not that long ago, you know, or not that, not that farther ahead. I can't even imagine like my, I operate a business with my phone and a laptop. Like that's insanity. And, And, you know, that didn't even exist, you know, not that long ago. So I mean, yeah, I, I, a couple of years ago, I, I bought my, my kids are uh, 16 now, but uh, so they, I don't know if you remember, there was a trend, the, the Polaroid cameras became oh, like, yeah. big again. So they, they saw it, they thought it was cool. So I bought it for them for Christmas. They opened it up. And so you had the camera and then you had the, you know, the cellophane package with the film in this. And uh, one of my boys goes, dad, what's that? And I'm like, Oh, that's the film. He goes, Oh, what's film? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are the moments where you're like, Oh man, I, I got old somewhere along the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, was no, I, I, I have those moments constantly. Now. I'm constantly <laughs> reminded. <laughs> I, know. I, know. I was explaining to my kids that phones used to be plugged into the wall and they just, they, they could not comprehend it. So. I was watching the. I don't know if you saw. You see Licorice Pizza? No. The it's a movie like set in the seventies. Oh, okay. uh, so yeah, like they they show like I mean I I tell my kids imagine like you had to like you're interested in a girl and you had to call their house and speak to their parents first to to get <laughs> her on the phone like <laughs> they're like no you had to do, yeah like that's what we had to do like it was and then I explained the whole phenomenon of like all right well. You know, you had a phone like and you, you answered it downstairs, but then you wanted privacy. So you wanted to go upstairs. So you had to like leave the phone off the hook. You had to go and take the other phone off the hook. And they're like, I, I mean, yeah. you, you can see like the deer in the headlights, like of what, you know. Like, it's I know. Crazy. Oh, man. I don't know how life just went so fast. See what I'm talking about? We get used to it so fast. Right. And that's, I mean, but genuinely that's happening right now in our industry. I I think, I think used to it is not even the, uh, the right word. It's, uh, you know, dependent on it. Not dependent. Yeah, exactly. And and borderline addicted to it. Um, absolutely. We can't go back. Could you imagine like we couldn't function. Yeah, no, I know. And, but, you know, kind of to bring it back to topic, like that's, that's what's happening now. And I see a lot of owners kind of holding on to that old school business model where, I, I mean, listen, if, if there's any time to be forward thinking in our industry, it's right now. And you don't have to be like some crazy innovator, but you need to be kind of on the crest of that. What you need to be on the front end of this thing. Uh, otherwise you're going to get left behind. And yeah, you know, I, I just, I'm worried about, you know, who's going to be picking up the pieces if a bunch of laundromat owners are getting left behind, you know, we'll see. <laughs> see. It, it, it will be, I, I think uh, a very, a very interesting next five years in, in, in this industry with the amount of capital, the amount of technology and the rapidly changing uh, habits of our consumer base um, with pickup and delivery and more and more people just valuing their time differently, sh- switching from self-service to full service. Like I, I think it's a, uh, like I said, a seismic shift in the industry. And um, with, with these periods of transition, 
uh, creates great turmoil, but it also creates great opportunity. So mm -hmm. things will shake out and there's going to be some, you know, major winners. But unfortunately, I think uh, the people that stay stale will um, ultimately lose out. Yeah. And I mean, just, you know, to your point, I, I genuinely get contacted at least every other week by some venture fund who's looking to enter into the business, uh, who's looking for, you know, some input into the industry or some insight or a board member or something. And I, I'm contacted all the time. Yeah. In fact, I have a call later this week with one. Uh, and so, you know, that to me, that's just telling me, hey, people outside of our industry are seeing how far behind we've gotten, you know, in, ter in comparison to the rest of things and are one and are, and well, are thinking there's an opportunity, but I mean, it might be too late for them now. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, you know, like we're like the last of Mohicans in, in, in retail. Right. So, uh, I remember going to the ICSC show, uh, 20 years ago and, uh, Landlords didn't want it. Laundromat wanted nothing to do with it as a dirty, seedy business. Um, you know, and, and now you, you go to a real estate show and people are clamoring for the retail use, so low default rates. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're the, uh, you know, when, when you look, it's always been recession proof, uh, our business. It's Amazon proof. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's um, it's a traffic uh, traffic generator, which is uh, you know key to all of retail right now, right? How do they get people away out of their house and you know moving into stores? Um, it's a consistent use. So th there's all these aspects of uh, the laundromat um, use that has made it like the the prize pony of the show now. And um, so I think, uh, I, I definitely think that, um, you know, you've, you've seen things come full circle and uh, there's, um, there, there's, there's a definite um, change on the horizon for the business. And, you know, but now you're going to see that there's going to be an evolution of it. So uh, because, because it's so prized and because it's so valuable and so sought after, there's an influx of capital. Now that technology finally comes, you're able to reinvent itself. And, um, you know, there was sort of, and this is horrible to say, and it always like drove me crazy, but there wasn't a lot of innovation or advancement in the laundromat industry because there was an attitude was like, yeah, well, they have no choice. Mm -hmm. This is what it is. And we're doing like people were doing fine. That's, that's about to change. Yeah. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Well, speaking of being, you know, up in front of the wave, uh, <laughs> let's talk about Mr. Jeff and what it is and, and, and what it does. So why don't you tell us what, what is Mr. Jeff? So Mr. Jeff is, uh, a a business in a box concept. So it, it, it at, at its DNA, the company is technology driven. The, the chief uh, product and technology officer, he got a PhD in AI 15 years ago. So you talk about being ahead of the curve, uh, brilliant. And uh, so the, the company was, uh, you know, founded on, on on the roots of technology and started in in laundry, but the vision is much bigger. The vision is uh, so we have other verticals as well that are developing. There's Jeff Fit, there's Jeff Coffee, there's Jeff uh, Works, Jeff Beauty. So it's creating an ecosystem for everybody's daily needs, and the the concept is. Um, you know, a hybrid of uh, bricks and mortar, bridging that bricks and mortar to the online and pick up and delivery. So the typical Mr. Jeff location is 500 to 1,000 square feet, um, you know, but uh, beautiful, bright, clean box. Um, 
where people can either come in, uh, drop off their laundry or dry cleaning items, uh, and then they can have it delivered home, or we'll pick up and deliver, or they can pick up and you know uh, drop off and pick up themselves. So there, there's there's an optionality there for the customer base, and what we found is because of what I mentioned uh, prior, because of that trust factor. A lot of people like to see the physical presence of the store, um, but rather than create this massive store and massive in- infrastructure and a huge capital investment, it's it's much smaller. Like a Mr. Jeff uh, typical box here in the states, you can get into for one hundred fifty, one hundred seventy five thousand dollars all in. Um, so that that lower cost of entry, but you still have this. Uh, brand equity and credibility of the bricks and mortar. People can see the cleanliness. They can see uh, the uniform staff behind the the shirt, professional uh, behind the counter. Um, You can see the, um, you know, professional marketing and then the apps there. So, and a lot of times the first service, they like to come in and talk about how they want their clothes so, uh, folded, how, what type of detergents we use and so forth and so on, and then eventually convert to online. But um, it's it's a franchise model. Um, the the, the, uh, the mantra or the mission of the company is to democratize entrepreneurship. So we're looking to make a um, uh, low cost of entry, low barriers to entry to get hardworking entrepreneurs into business and equip them with every tool they need to run the business. So Mr. Jeff will provide the driver's app. They'll provide the um, customer facing app. They'll provide the business suite. Um, the marketing platform, there's a chat bot that'll take them through everything that they need to do to execute a, an online marketing program on their own. There's a Jeff Academy to learn everything you need to know about the, the laundry and dry cleaning business, how to process clothes, and then how to run a business in general. And then every franchisee gets assigned a partner success manager who's there to uh, with them you know, from the time they sign the franchise agreement to find the location, to build out the location, to launch their grand opening, and then every day thereafter for whatever needs they have to to support them in the business. So, you know, for me, Mr. Jeff gives the, the, you know, it's a combination that had always been missing in this business. So you get the, the big company branding power, the big tech behind you, the big uh, marketing capabilities, everything that uh, consolidation or the lack of consolidation didn't provide historically. But then you give that into that, you put that in the hands of the owner operator. And as I mentioned long before, the owner operator executes on the quality and the consistency and hiring the right people and making sure they're caring about their staff and making sure they're caring about the customer and providing that hospitality. So the, the combination between um, uh, all the uh, fixed assets that would be very expensive uh, and nearly impossible for an individual store owner to build, Jeff has built, and then they're giving that platform to the entrepreneur to go out and, and make their business successful. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And I, I it's kind of an interesting uh, niche within the, within the market. Cause I think, you know, when I think of laundromats and where a lot of laundromats are going, it's kind of like what we were talking about earlier. Some of those big kind of box store esque, you know, I see looking around LA here when I'm up in the Bay area a little bit, like bigger, uh, bigger laundromats are, are, you know, kind of the thing now. Um, but this is more of, you know, that, that smaller location, but wider radius of service model, which I think actually works. And I'm generally speaking, not, uh, not a huge fan of, uh, self-service laundromat franchises, 
But in terms of pickup and delivery, I think it might make sense a lot. Uh, definitely makes sense in my mind more than, uh, you know, uh, a self-serve only type me, franchise model. Yeah, me, me too, by the way. Um, I, I'm not, uh, I, or at least yet, I, I don't see the value in a self-service franchise. <laughs> and largely because when I was at CleanRight and for years and, you know, uh, working on other concepts as well, um, we tried, uh, you know, and others tried and failed. Spin Cycle had 200 stores, but there wasn't branding power on the self-service side. Um, and at CleanRight, when we sold a store, um, we would make the new operator take down the signage and put up new marks. And, you know, like there was no difference between a clean right center and Joe's laundromat. Um, so I, I have a hard time understanding what the value proposition is of a franchise system that's going to take six, eight percent off the top line of revenue. What are you getting in return for that? Well, you know, like that you couldn't go to a distributor and, you know, have them build like the, the same box can be built across the street um, with the same technology, the same machinery, the, the same system. And you're not paying uh, six to eight percent in royalties. So I, I, I didn't see um, the value there and that there, there's not a lot that they're doing in terms of game changing the self-service end of the business. Where on the service side, there is a lot that can be done. If, you, if you've if you ever, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you're trying to either build a wash and fold or pick up and delivery uh, program, you, you know that you need tech, you need logistics apps, you need digital marketing. Um, as I mentioned, branding and trust is critically important in that side of the business. So all these aspects lend itself to a franchise concept. In fact, like we've we've always believed in this uh, in in the industry. Um, we've done it. We've done it in different ways where we have a, like a leasing concept, or we whenever we sold stores to uh, to an owner operator in the past, um, you saw the over the counter business go up. Self-service business didn't change very much. If, if anything, it went down a little bit because they didn't invest in the same way of keeping their equipment running or the cleanliness or so. But over-the-counter business went up from that hands-on owner-operator. So we see that being a franchise business. The problem is, is that um, the, the, the systems and technology and the marketing platforms didn't exist. So that, that's everything that Jeff brings to the table and, and uh, provides value in, in the franchise program uh, um, platform. And the, the other aspect is, is that, that, uh, that uh, that's where all the growth is. So I, I we, like without trying when, you know, uh, at, at clean, right. Wash and fold sales group kept, keep growing year over year where it used to be virtually, uh, you know, it, it was non-existent uh, in terms of the model when we first started, it's upwards of 20% of our business and some stores, uh, some locations, even more. So you're seeing this gravitational pull towards the service side of the business. That's uh, there's an inertia to it that it's not going to be able to stop. And I just think the habits of society in general, everything is going to online app, um, pickup and delivery service. So th there's there's no reason why laundry isn't going to follow suit. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I'm, I'd be interested to see, because I mean, you guys are relatively new in the States, right? I mean, I know you've been here for a little while, but you're relatively new, right? Yeah, so we we just we just launched to come to the states uh, and and started marketing franchises over the summer. So our first our first uh, Mr. Jeff location will be open uh, in Coral Gables in hopefully uh, I'd say two to three weeks, and then uh, more in the pipeline to follow. So you know there, there's 
it, it takes time to find locations and build stores, but um, we're starting to build out stores now as we speak. Yeah. So I'd be interested to see how this goes for you guys, because I mean, I think you're hitting it at, like you mentioned before, we talked about before, like it's a very intriguing time to be coming in and that pickup and delivery or that drop off laundry side, uh, the service side of our business, because I see that as being one of the big plays for, you know, going forward and where a a lot of, like you said, a lot of the growth is going to be in our industry is going to be on the service side of the business. You know, and um, when when you, when you think about it from, uh, I I just believe it's going to be a disruptive force uh, in the industry and um, people throw that word around a lot. So, you know, I I, I don't want to sound cliche, but when, when you see all the elements are there that it, it's ripe for that. So, um, you, you know, when you look at that industries that tend to be disruptive, there, there usually is a complacency in the status quo and uh, an inefficiency that exists that just because of the power structure and the major players that exist, they, they've sort of forced it to remain inefficient long term. And that, that inefficiency is equipment utilization. So even in a great store, I mean, uh, your utilization overall could be 30 percent. Right. So, you, you know, you build a new big box laundromat today, uh, you know, you're putting million two, million five into it. Um, and w- what is what is the bulk of that payment? Majority of that payment is the equipment. Um, mm-hmm. Equipment manufacturers are very happy with with this model, right? They they sell a lot of equipment, they sell a lot of parts. When it's time for a retool, you retool an entire store. Um, it's it's a great equation, uh, except for the fact that the owners just con- you know continue to load debt onto their balance sheet. Um, and uh, listen, there there has been a decent return, but um, there is a different way to do this. And when you look at uh, the Mr. Jeff model and you see with a limited amount of equipment, how productive these machines could be. And imagine a world where you bought equipment modular uh, in a modular sense where you know you added equipment as you needed it. So you start with a couple pieces of equipment. As your business grows, you you add more uh, equipment, and then you know maybe add you know pop in another small location as as the demand grows, so that your um, your sunk cost is very light, and you just uh, continue to have this incredible ROI. I mean, how happy would you be in your laundromat if all of your equipment all of your equipment just spun all day long? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I'd be ecstatic. And in fact, we had uh, Andrew Cunningham who's been on the show and he was basically saying, hey, if your machines aren't doing 24 turns a day, then you're they're underutilized, right? Like it's even, I mean, even a great, like some of the most fantastic turns per day stats I've heard are like 10 turns per day. Yeah. You know, people don't want to share those because, you know, they're, they're right for competition coming in. But 10 per, turns per day is awesome. But that's, still only half utilized, like 50% utilized, right? Like it's, if you're going to be a 24 hour store. So, I mean, that's, I I like what you're saying. And I think it makes a lot of sense that the machines that we buy can be much more productive than, than typical, which is why I think people do, um, do bring in, you know, pick up and delivery or drop off service to try to get those, make them more productive. Right. Um, but you're right. I like, I like what you're saying here. And then I think, I think eventually, and uh, you know, uh, my vision is down the road that um, we're, we're going to uh, develop what's called the the hybrid model for Jeff, where we layer in a very small self-service uh, component. So instead of having these massive stores, we'll have smaller footprint stores of 2000 square feet 
and um and and the rationale we like we we could never when i was at clean right we could never pencil out uh small stores because of the labor component because mm-hmm. you can't have half a person working or a quarter of a person so you needed the bigger stores to justify the sunk cost of labor you know if you're open 24 hours a day that's 160 labor hours um you really couldn't you, you couldn't justify a small store on self-service but with mr jeff it changes the dynamic because you have the labor fully loaded now on the service side and to maintain a self-service operation um you're not adding any incremental labor they need to keep the store clean keep the bathroom clean um make sure uh you know the the customers um, know how to use the equipment, answer a few questions, but it's like you're not going to have to add more labor to run that. So to me, that that's just a incremental uh, revenue stream that you layer on. So it's sort of you you reverse engineer this rather than build the massive laundromat and make a you know do a little wash and fold business. You have the wash and fold pick up a delivery business and then just add extra revenue. Uh, from the self-service side, and and you also now create a um, pipeline for new customers for full service. Mm -hmm. So they come in at a lower price entry point of self-service, or they haven't completely trusted leaving their clothes with somebody. They see a friendly attendant. They see them doing other people's clothes. Um, They, you know, maybe have dry cleaning items, they wash their own clothes, leave their dry cleaning items. And then you, uh, you then convert that customer to full service. And now you have more capacity opened up for uh, additional self service. So you you keep on feeding that pipeline of sales, which, which I think is a incredibly lucrative model. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Okay. So who, who, who's the right person for this business? Who's, you know, who, if people are listening to this right now and they're kind of intrigued, like who should be, who should be looking into this a little deeper here? So, you know, I, I I think that there, there's certainly a broad spectrum of uh, entrepreneurs who, who could make this work. Um, I, I do know just some uh, specific experience in, in the past in the industry. I happen to believe that uh, small restaurant owners who have been, um, you know, really beat up by the pandemic uh, and are, have struggled, many of them closed. I think that they have, you know, a really good uh, skill set and profile that will uh, check all the boxes of that. You know, they have the front of the house, hospitality, customer service, engaging marketing to customers, especially a small restaurant that does pick up and delivery, because now they know uh, not uh, pick up just delivery. Pick up the ingredient, make your food and delivery. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, um, but they also have the back of the house experience of, you know, that attention to detail and constant operations and quality and, and consistency managing the labor force. And then for them, when, when I've brought people from the restaurant industry into this industry, they're, they're blown away. They love it because the margins are better. Uh, it's lower labor to manage um, and uh, their, their quality of life is so much better um, in, in, in this business. So that's definitely a target I'd like to tap into because I think that there's a lot of uh, great, hardworking uh, restaurant owners who have been um, unfortunately displaced. And I think their skills would be put to good work um, in in this business. But um, I, I wouldn't preclude anybody, uh, you know, um, that that just wants, uh, you know, that that wants to uh, get into a business for uh, you know low cost of entry, um, and uh, you know, put in put in their time and. Uh, work hard and, 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 and make good money. Um, you know, I, I think that it's, it's really, it's really that simple. Yeah. Uh, I mean, out of curiosity is, 
if there's somebody who maybe they already own a laundromat or they own a couple laundromats uh, or whatever, I mean, is this something that, you know, if they want to add a pickup and delivery or a drop off or something like that, is this something for them? What would that look like for somebody who already owns a laundromat? Yeah, so we have, uh, so I would say there's two different profile of laundromat owners that I would speak to. The, the first is the laundromat owner that's sort of uh, been in this game a long time, um, more tired, was hoping their kids were going to take over the business. Their kids, they, they did a good job providing for their kids, put them through great colleges, and now their kids don't want to work in the laundromat business. So they, they don't have an exit strategy. Um, they, they have a cash flow in business, but you know, they're, they're not looking to really, uh, reinvent the world here. Um, and uh, they're resistant to the change and don't want to deal with all that. I would say there's an opportunity for them to, uh, sort of be a sub landlord to a Jeff franchisee. So you don't have to reinvent your business. You don't have to put in more time and energy, just Give Mr. Jeff a, a small spot in, in your laundromat. They'll pay you rent. They'll feed the machines for the wash and fold. And that could be a really good win-win uh, situation for an uh, operator of that profile. If it's an operator profile that is seeing the change on the horizon, um, seeing this demand for wash and fold, maybe they have a competitor down the street that's eating into them a little bit that that's doing wash and fold pickup and delivery, but they're, um, you know, uh, don't really know how to get into it or looking, evaluating software systems, evaluating marketing, um, and just really, uh, want a good partner in all of that, a whole turnkey solution for getting into the wash and fold pickup and delivery side and get, in with a growing brand, um, I, th- I think that that would be an opportunity for that type of profile of of, of operator. Yeah, that's awesome. And, uh, I mean, they like become franchising. Yeah, right. I like uh, I like having kind of a couple different options there for for different types of laundromat owners. So, my last question is: if anybody's intrigued by this, <clears throat> I mean, we've talked about a lot of really interesting stuff. So there might be a couple of different types of people, uh, who might want to have a chat with you. Uh, so number one, I mean, it could be somebody who just is intrigued by some of the stuff that you've talked about, some of the points you brought up, you know, had some questions for you, likes, you know, the experience you've had and maybe thinks that, you know, they want to connect with you or ask you a question or whatever, or maybe somebody's interested in Mr. Jeff, you know, either on the, Hey, I'll be a, you know, a sub landlord or I'll, I'm interested in being a franchisee. What's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, so I, as you can tell, like I, I'm uh, happy to talk about this industry anytime. So uh, anyone who wants to reach out to me uh, can get me at uh, Peter dot Stern at Mister Jeff App dot com. That's A P P. And uh, yeah, uh, for for whatever the reason, or if people just want to kind of uh, they're they're curious about the uh, the industry and my experience, or happy to. I'm always happy to chat with people in and out of the industry about the industry. It's been uh, you know a lifelong journey and passion of mine. So um, yeah, reach out to me anytime. Despite the fact that you were in first grade, it was not your aspiration. No, I, you know, I, I still like, I, I'm, uh, I'm about to be 47 years old and I, I still play baseball. Like I play in like an old man's league and, I'm, you know, I, I get up on Sunday morning and I, you know, there's, there's gotta be a scout out there that's going to see the potential still. If Tom Brady could do it at his age, like uh, in the NFL, I, I can, I can still make it right. Like there's a Disney movie to be made about. Me. That's what I'm talking about. Well, I have found that the best way to get seen by the scouts is to be on this podcast. So I'd expect a couple phone calls. Uh, a lot of, I mean, a huge part of my audience is, is you, professional baseball scouts. They're looking for a, an aging uh, 
rag arm uh, catcher whose knees don't work anymore and, you know, can, can sort of, has no power left, you know, like I, I'm, I'm your guy, like I'll, right. I'll make it happen for your organization. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Hey, you know what? The giants probably could use you. So <laughs> maybe like a you call. Uh, Peter, man, this has been awesome. A lot of really, really good stuff. Uh, I have a couple of questions left for you. Um, we have two segments that I want to run by you. Number one is called the secret sauce. Listen up. It's the secret sauce. And the secret sauce is basically, hey, if you have one piece of advice you could give to somebody who either now currently owns a laundromat with all your laundromat experience that you have, or who maybe owns a pick and delivery, your choice, uh, what, what's the best piece of advice you could give them to help them improve their business? Yeah, so I, I think that um, get outside of your business. I think that, uh, you know, uh, one of the mistakes, especially when I own my own stores, was that I spent so much time and attention and focus inside my box that you become tunnel vision. You also have a uh, you have a bad feedback loop. So as I mentioned before, I talk to my customers all the time. But, you know, largely when I was talking to my customers, they were there, so they were happy. So they were giving me positive feedback and that felt good. But, you know, so I would say, you know, get outside your box, not only um, into competitors, see what uh, competitors are doing and, uh, and people out there in the industry in general, but even outside of the laundry industry, um, look for inspiration elsewhere. We've been behind the curve for a long time. As I mentioned, the rate of change has been, you know, uh, dramatic, which has put us further. The, the chasm is so great between uh, the laundry industry as a sense day and where society is going. So get out there and say, use different apps. It doesn't have to be laundry apps. Um, you know, you use different um, services, uh, you know, go out and pay it when you're in other retail operations, pay attention to what they're doing. I think there's a lot that we can all bring from the outside and make our industry better. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I mean, uh, seriously, super good advice because, you know, number one, yes, we've been kind of lagging behind and there are other sectors of the retail industry that are doing things more innovatively and stuff like that, that we can learn from, but also just that other perspective, you know, I found that looking outside of, what I'm doing. Um, that's why I read a lot of business books. There's really not a whole lot of laundromat books out there, you know, but, uh, there's, there's a few and, but I read a lot of business books, a lot of, you know, personal development books, all those things, uh, biographies, you know, because it gives really good insight and, and podcasts, lots of other podcasts. I mean, this is really the only one you need, but if you wanted to, you can listen to some other ones, uh, you know, but it, it does give you kind of a fresh perspective and new, you know, ideas to try out and new, um, you know, points of reference to, to work from. And so I think, I mean, I think that's great advice for any laundromat owner. It can be hard to do because like you mentioned before, doing the day in day out, keeping things consistent, you know, it, it, it's tough sometimes uh, and it can be a grind and time consuming, but it's well worth taking that step back and, and looking around what's going on around you. I think that's great. Yeah. Uh, the second uh, section that we have or segment that we have is called pro tips. Pro tips. And pro tips is for maybe the person who is looking to buy their first laundromat or the person who maybe has a laundromat and wants to start a pickup and delivery or the person who doesn't have a laundromat, but wants to start a pickup and delivery. Uh, so pro tips is what advice do you have for them to help get them started in the right direction? Or what do they need to know before they get going? Yeah. So, uh, getting, getting into this business, I, you know, I, I think that, um, I have, uh, in my 20 years in the industry, everyone has like, a friend or an uncle or somebody that, that heard about the business and wants to get into it. And uh, so they 
say, will you talk to them? And I reach out to them. And I think I've talked more people out of getting into the business than, than getting in, than getting into the business. Um, and I think that, that, well, I, I guess I take that responsibility seriously. If somebody's coming to me, I know they're looking with their nest egg and they're going to, you know, invest their hard earned life savings into a business. I don't take that lightly. So I, I think that, um, you know, uh, I tell them the good, the bad and the ugly. And I think getting to somebody like that is important. And so um, going to a car salesman and asking them about why, you know, if they think it's a good idea or how they should buy this car is not only is not always the, the, the best resource. So trying to find an unbiased resource about getting into the industry where you can get some facts, um, you know, and uh, I, certainly I'm not the only one, but um, uh, I, I think like, you know, listening to like your podcast is, is certainly helpful. The Coin Laundry Association is great. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great resource for anyone looking to, to get into the industry. But, uh, you know, and then then you got to you got to be realistic with um, your capital structure and what you want to do. So there, there, there's different avenues, as we, some of them we touched upon today. There's, you know, the big box laundromat. There's the people that want to you know build a chain of laundromats in a region. Um, there's more of the, the lower cost of entry, as we described with the Mr. Jeff uh, traditional bo- box, if you, you don't have the, you know, robust capital structure um, to get into. So I, I would say that, do you know, doing all that soul searching up front um, and then understanding uh, the level of commitment. I think that this is a largely sold as a, uh, absentee business to a lot of people. And I think that I, I discourage people from thinking that way. I, uh, um, it's certainly, like I said, it's a better quality of life than uh, typically in the restaurant industry, um, especially if you're good at uh, recruiting, building and uh, developing a staff. And But, you know, somebody needs to lead them. Um, and, and, and especially in the beginning, building that culture is intensive. And I think that the owners should be there and, and understand their business, uh, understand the loopholes, the shortcuts uh, in order to manage it better. So um, I think, uh, under you know, being realistic about the, the time commitment. Um, and then I, 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 God, I mean, this is, uh, it's a, I think a different uh, podcast, to be honest with you, to all the things that I would tell somebody getting to, I mean, from the real estate perspective to the design and layout of the store to, um, you know, what their marketing approach is. Like, there's so many things to consider um, that I, I just, I wouldn't take it light, lightly, especially especially in the traditional, uh, if they're uh, putting a large amount of capital into it. So, yeah, maybe yeah. Uh, exposure to competition. Like, you know, the one thing to think about when you're putting in a million five asset is not only is it going to be successful today, but is it going to be successful five, 10, 20 years from today? And knowing how you're defensively positioned in the market is also important because you could build it in a good spot for today, but then you left a prime spot for somebody to, you know, take over all your hard work. There's, there's a lot. So <laughs> I would say call somebody like you or me, like, you know, th- talk it, talk it through, uh, spend, spend uh, a good amount of time before you pull, pull that trigger. Yeah. I was just thinking maybe we should figure out a time where we can do a, a live webinar where we can go through a bunch of that stuff a little more pointedly <clears throat> with some people and they can answer some questions. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, for do, sure. Helpful for people. So, uh, yeah, I'd love to do it. Yeah. So to sum up your, your secret sauce and your pro tips is get outside input. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Uh, awesome. Peter, this has been, uh, incredible again. I'm going to have the, uh, Peter's email address in the show notes and 
If you're on YouTube, it'll be down in the description. But just so you know, it's peter.stern at mrjeffapp.com. And again, that, that'll be in the show notes and in the description. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. It has been an awesome conversation. That just flew by for me. Um, yeah. I, I took a few pages of notes. So I appreciate <laughs> you coming on and at least teaching me. Uh, a whole bunch. Oh, my 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 pleasure, Jordan. Hopefully, hopefully your fans get uh, some use out of it. All right, listen. When are you going to start believing me when I say that these interviews are incredible and you're going to love them? I mean, every week I know I pretty much say that, but these interviews are so good, so full of practical, tangible information. A big thank you to Peter uh, for joining us and and uh, sharing all that wisdom that he has gathered over the last like 20 years in the industry. So good. Well, even though this thing was packed with information, knowledge, uh, practical tips, all that stuff. None of it's going to do any good unless you put it into action, right? Talk about this all the time. So pick one thing from this interview and put it into action, okay? Whether it's something that, uh, you know, Peter said maybe in the Secret Sauce or Pro Tips or something that we talked about kind of all throughout the interview. There's just so much good stuff in there. Pick at least one thing and do something with it this week. Make your dreams happen through the actions that you take. All right. Uh, again, Again, thanks a lot for having so much interest in the in the analysis calculator that you crashed it. Go check it out, lawnmountresource.com slash calculators. Um, and again, pro members, you know, go download that book on due diligence. It's there well before it's come out to the masses. So if you haven't yet checked out the pro membership, check it out at lawnmountresource.com slash pro. And otherwise, we'll see you guys at whatever the next thing is. Maybe the next podcast episode, the next webinar, maybe on YouTube, uh, on the blog, on the website, uh, maybe at the Laundromat Millionaire Conference. I'm going to be there in person, live. I would love to hang out with you March 2nd to 4th. I'll put a link in the show notes, or you can check out laundromatmillionaire.com. Click on the conference and register and come hang out with me and a bunch of other like crazy all-stars in this industry. All right. All right. We'll see you guys later. Peace.